body parts found seemingly scattered, some say dispersed intentionally across Metro Milwaukee, not just murder, but careful dissection, human dismemberment tonight into the mind of a human butcher. Good evening. I'm Nancy Grace. I want to thank you for being with us. I've tried a lot of homicides. I have investigated many, many more and covered many, many more. But dismemberment of the human body is a whole nother animal. Again, thank you for being with us. First of all, take a listen to this. 5.30 p.m. April 2nd, Cudahy police respond to a call along Lake Michigan. At Warnemont Park, a popular recreation area, a park goer reports finding a severed human leg. According to a post from Cudahy Sheriff's Office, the limb was found in or near the water east of the golf course near the pump house. There are steep cliffs leading to the shoreline in that area, and large numbers of police canvassed the area and kept away gawkers. Can you imagine that scene? Body parts found around 5.30 p.m. Police responding to a call along Lake Michigan. You know, so often we cover cases where a jogger, a walker, finds a body. What about body parts? Straight out to our guest, joining us on the All-Star panel to make sense of what we're knowing right now, to Bill Daly, former FBI investigator and uh, expert in forensic photography. Bill Daly, thank you for being with us. You know, I've seen many a gruesome crime scene, but body parts is a whole nother thing. You ever had a dismembered body? Well, certainly I've, I've covered those photos as being a forensic photographer and having to prepare the, the background documentation in the laboratory. So I, I am kind of familiar with the situation. I'm also familiar, Nancy, with the fact that unfortunately we've seen this happen here in our country before. It was only about a month ago, uh, we're in Suffolk County, New York, uh, early morning schoolgoers through a park found a, a, a severed arm. So unfortunately, we're seeing this now happen in our country. And why it's a phenomenon, not saying these two are connected in any way, but it's something that we're seeing happening. And, and the question is why? Why are people driven to commit, if this is an act of, of murder, why are, they commit, act, uh, why are they forced to commit those acts? Well, number one, I can tell you this much, Bill Daly. It is an act of murder unless the person killed themselves and severed their own body parts. But you read my mind, Bill Daly, because one of my big thoughts is, uh, are dismemberments on the rise? Because I, I, in the last month, we've seen three separate dismemberment cases. I'm not talking about just in Milwaukee, but you're absolutely correct. And Alexis Tereshek, I'm going to be with you in just one moment, but I want to follow up on what Bill Daly said with Dr. Eric Eason, board certified forensic pathologist, consultant. Uh, you can find him on Insta, Eric under A, A under Eason. Dr. Eason, thank you for being with us. When you look at dismembered body parts, I'm very curious about what you can learn from the actual severing marks. Can you learn if it's from the person severed by a saw, a knife, um, a, a, so, a sword even? We've had that before, a machete-type sword used in severance. And the reason I ask is because certain tools actually have to be plugged in at the time, which gives me another idea and a clue as to where the dismemberment occurred. Correct. Yeah, it's called tool mark analysis. And uh, so what we do in the morgue is uh, we'll examine the remains uh, initially and uh, take photographs and uh, do some other examinations. We'll look at the edges of the bones and try and look for what we call striations on the bones. And then we refer to a forensic anthropologist hold to on, a, a hold better on, exam. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Dr. Eason, remember, we're just mere mortals. You're the medical examiner. When you say right. striation marks, the first time I dealt with striation marks, S-T-R-I-A, striation, striation, was with ballistics, uh, looking at these striation marks on two bullets, the known bullet, 
which you fire at the crime lab, and the unknown bullet, which is taken from a crime scene. You think you have the murder weapon? You shoot a bullet through with that murder weapon, then go under a microscope, and you see wiggle lines. And if they match, the two bullets match, you know right. it's from that gun. So striation marks, in my mind, are tool marks left by a right. gun. So what's a striation mark as it relates to a severed body. I don't want to get too deep in the woods here, but I want to know the answer to that. Well, instead of being left by a gun, it would be left by the metal pieces of the saw or the axe or uh, possibly a serrated knife or something like that, that when it goes through the bone, it's going to leave the marks onto the bone, similar to when a bullet goes through oh, the barrel. The bone. Uh, right. Now I understand. So it's the markings left on the bone. See, I was thinking about looking at the skin to see uh, what kind of marking was left on the skin, if you could tell what tool was used. But that's making much more sense to me because the skin is supplyable. You can't get a good read on the tool used. You Looking at the bone. Now I get it. The markings left on the bone will tell you what type of tool was used. If you can figure that out, it helps you figure out where the dismemberment occurred. Okay, I am getting way DEFCOM 4 here on the striation marks on bones uh, when you look at a dismembered body. But let's get back to this. Hey, Bill Daly, former FBI investigator, and uh, renowned forensic photography expert, do you remember the first dismembered body you photographed? Um, I, I actually do remember seeing those first photos uh, that was uh, in, a, in a mob type of uh, style hit. Um, and uh, certainly it was a message that was being sent to other mobsters. So I do remember it. You know, that's um, curious because I bet everybody on this panel remembers the first time they saw a dead body. I do. Uh, the first time I saw an autopsy photo. It sticks with you forever. Mm -hmm. So my point is to Alexis Tereschuk joining me, CrimeOnline.com investigative reporter. Can you imagine the person that comes upon an actual body part? Not a picture, uh, not a, a depiction, not a, a description written a police report. The real thing. Now, how were, were then there's a series of three sets of body parts found, some say strewn, some say intentionally placed across Milwaukee. Tell me about the first set. So the first thing that is found is a severed leg. So not, and again, you're talking about bodies. This isn't seeing your grandmother in the coffin at her funeral. This is an actual broken, torn apart leg found by Lake Michigan, which is, if people don't, Lake Michigan is like an ocean. It is so big. So you, you think, did something wash up on the shore? Where did this leg come from? But it wasn't eaten away or it wasn't damaged too much. It was clearly identifiable as okay, wait, a leg. Wait, 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 so that wait, wait, wait. First thing that we Hold on. Got a question for you, Alexis. You say, I mean, it's a severed leg, but you're saying it was in good shape. For us in forensics, are you saying the leg was still in good shape? I, I am actually saying the leg was in good shape. It, it wasn't unidentifiable. It, it was clearly a leg. It wasn't something where you just found the bone. That's important, Alexis, that one phrase you used. Because when you take this to a jury, you've got to be able to determine how old uh, let me rephrase, how long the person has been killed. Dr. Eric Eason yeah. joining us, renowned medical examiner. Dr. Eason, we're using lay terms, Alexis and I, that the leg was in, quote, good shape. That's actually significant because you can date the time, not necessarily within a 30-minute period, but how many days have passed if the leg is still in good shape. When you get a skeletonized bone, forget about it. You're not going to be able to right. date the death. But what can you learn from this one dismembered leg? And this is critical to this case. Well, with the skin intact and hopefully the muscle intact uh, and hopefully the bone marrow would still be intact, you can use that to run DNA testing and try and match it with who the, the victim was. Um, that's the important thing. You know, when you 
get skeletonized remains that have been around for a couple of years, it's tough, more uh, difficult to get uh, a DNA sample. But from this one, you should be able to get a pretty good sample and uh, try and figure out who this person was. Also, you can determine when the murder occurred based on the condition of the leg. If decomp has right. totally set in, that gives me a timeline. If the it leg does. looks like it's fresh, for lack of a better term, that gives me a timeline. Then I try to figure out who's missing in that timeline. And can you tell immediately looking at the leg, isn't this true, Dr. Eason? You can tell immediately whether it's a woman or a man, an adult or a child, the race. You can learn so much. Yes? Right. Yes. Now, that's compared to when you find a skeletonized body part and you look at, say, a femur which is part of the leg, or the tibia. Can you look at a bone, a skeletonized bone, doctor, and determine, based on the leg bone alone, whether it's a male or a female? It'd be tough for me to do it, and so uh, we have special uh, doctors known as forensic anthropologists that actually examine bones. They only examine bones, and they'd be able to, to handle something like that, but... Uh, I do know that uh, but it can be done. you really need a pelvis. It can be done, yeah, just not by me. Yes, because the pelvis is shaped in a, a manner uh, where you can determine if the pelvis is fit to have children. It's, it's the right. only way I know how to say it. Is there a better way to say that, a more clinical way? Uh, a wider birth canal, possibly. <laughs> Yeah, to, to okay. allow for the passage yeah, of a, right. uh, Okay, I'm going to stick with yeah. mine, if you don't mind. You say right. potato, <laughs> I'll say potato. Going forward, Alexis Tereschuk, back to you. And remember, we've got Dr. John Delatore, Matthew Mangino, uh, former prosecutor, now private lawyer, Bill Daly, Dr. Eason. Jump in if you have a thought. Or a question. So, Alexis, what is it? A jogger, a walker? Who finds a severed leg by make, by Lake Michigan? Right, just somebody who's in the park. This is a public park. It's not a, a hidden area at all. So, just somebody out walking finds the leg, and they contact the local police immediately because it's, as I said, clearly identifiable as a leg. It's not even a bone, and you would think, oh, maybe that's a dog bone or a coyote or something. It's an actual leg. You know, Matthew, hey, you know with me. Daily. Yeah, jump yeah, in. Nancy. Yeah, so Nancy, I, I would yeah. going back to your thought before about identifying, you know, a leg like this, which is which is, appears to be fairly recent. Uh, you'd also be looking for things such as tattoos, be looking for other markings on on the skin that may be still there that could give an indication as to you suggested any people who may have been missing in and around that time frame. So uh, investigators will start to look at those type of things. Certainly, if the body part has a hand, maybe there are rings or some other identifying marks that might be tied back to perhaps some missing persons. 5.30 p.m. April 2nd, Cudahy police respond to a call along Lake Michigan. At Warnemont Park, a popular recreation area, a park goer reports finding a severed human leg. According to a post from Cudahy Sheriff's Office, the limb was found in or near the water east of the golf course near the pump house. There are steep cliffs leading to the shoreline in that area and large numbers of police canvassed the area and kept away gawkers. Three days after the Warnemont Park discovery, another call to police about a severed body part. 11 miles away from the shores of Lake Michigan in a Milwaukee West Side neighborhood, a body part is found at a playground. Police received the call around 10 p.m. Friday night, but investigators are tight-lipped on exactly where the body part is found or what remains are recovered. Okay, Alexis Tereschuk, first, a severed leg washes up. Well, it's found. Don't know if it washed up, but it's found by Lake Michigan. When I say wash up, Alexis, I always think about Lacey Peterson Same. and her unborn child, Connor, mm -hmm. because they washed up uh, there yeah. at San Francisco Bay. You and I covered that together. Now, three days after the severed leg is discovered beside Lake Michigan, worst nightmare, body parts on a playground. This is three days after the severed leg is found. Tell me. Exactly. Three days after the severed leg is found, they find there's a park where kids play, like a playground with, you know, jungle gym and 
human remains are found, the body part. Now, the police have not said what this body part is, but it was found in a park. And it's about 10 miles away from where the first one was found. But again, Milwaukee's a huge city. 10 miles isn't that far. To Dr. John Delatore joining me, licensed psychologist uh, who specializes in forensic psychology. Uh, Dr. Delatore, placing body parts at a child's playground? First of all, I want to say, don't you have a problem with that? But that's <laughs> on so many levels. You've got a murder, obviously, you've got a dismemberment, and you have the killer. That's why when I hear scattered across Milwaukee, this isn't scattered. Scattered, like thrown out of the car, like litter or trash. This is intentionally placed at a playground by someone that must know children are going to find a body part. Yeah, absolutely. This is definitely intentional. I don't think that there's uh, there's a specific play uh, placement for these uh, for these body parts. I think this person wants to stroke fear in the community. It's not enough to stroke fear within the victim. It's more about also striking fear in the community for whatever is you know compelling this individual to engage in these behaviors. But these are clearly designed to stroke. Uh, a, a, a level of uh, of fear within each community to 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 as a secondary part of whatever it is that this person is going through. So I, I, I'm very curious. Uh, earlier, Bill Daly, former FBI investigator, sparked the question: Are dismemberments on the rise? Uh, here we see someone murdering and dismembering. Now we've got two sets of body parts. Are they connected? Are they the same person? Are they two people? Are they more than two people? So Bill Daly, the fact that this person, and let's just hope it's just one person, one killer at work dismembering, the mindset of placing the second set of body parts at a playground. What do you make of that, Bill? Uh, yeah, Nancy, and I'm going to kind of borrow a little bit from uh, the people I know from the FBI's behavioral analysis uh, side of the house, you know, and it goes to show you kind of that, that depravity. And I think, you know, echoing what was just talked about, you know, it goes to show you that someone wanted to make this kind of splash, wanted to have this kind of uh, this, this uh, impression this kind of fear that is out there, or perhaps even showing that they themselves are so powerful that they can do this, but doing it to a child's playground. And it does echo what I just mentioned before about some young young children going to school, finding body parts in Suffolk County, New York. Um, you know, it's a certainly a life altering, I'm sure, situation for those 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 children, but also it's, it sends a fear through the community. Uh, people who go to parks, people who go and you know, go jogging or, or send the children off to play. I mean, the thought that you can't even send people off to a park without being, you know, faced with some uh, heinous act uh, is, is terribly dis disruptive and disappointing to people in those communities. Dr. Eric Eason, isn't it true that there are rapid DNA tests that have, I think probably uh, most likely mitochondrial DNA on the mother's side only that were used, that has been used for decades, for instance, in war to get an immediate, almost immediate ID. So it's not like you got to send off the DNA and wait for three weeks to get an answer. You can get within the same day a DNA answer. Right. It's not one in five million, but it's one in 5,000 at, right. you know, at worst. Isn't that true? Correct. Yes. So, you know, the, the, the aspect of murder, dismemberment, and then placing the body parts where they will absolutely be found. Listen to this. Within 24 hours, police respond to another call about the discovery of human remains. On Saturday, just a few blocks from the same west side Milwaukee area as Friday's discovery, police set up a crime scene near a park. Around 7.15 p.m., the medical examiner arrives to remove the body part. Police block off the area and canvas well past midnight, according to neighbors. 
Okay, uh, Alexis Terechuk, a third set, three sets of body parts found. Tell me about the third discovery. The third discovery was in another park in the area. So this is all south of Milwaukee, like the, the center of the, the big city. Tons of parks all on the shore around the lake, which as you're seeing in the map, the, the lake is to the east of the, of the city. And they're super close to each other, just blocks away from each other. So now three times we found body parts. First, there's the leg, then there's another site finding, then there's another one. After that, four total parts, human remains have been found. And they're not being identified at all. So that's the thing. The police are keeping this very close. They're not saying it was a hand. They're not saying, um, you know, a torso, a chest, another arm, another leg, none of that. The only thing that has been identified is the leg. The rest have been called human remains. Within 24 hours, police respond to another call about the discovery of human remains. On Saturday, just a few blocks from the same west side Milwaukee area as Friday's discovery, police set up a crime scene near a park. Around 7.15 p.m., the medical examiner arrives to remove the body part. Police block off the area and canvas well past midnight, according to neighbors. The third set of body parts found. Curious, Alexis Terezchuk, uh, joining us, CrimeOnline.com investigative reporter. All three sets of body parts were found in or near parks. Uh, the first one, yes. it was a little misleading. Yes, it was near Lake Michigan. We know that. We also know it was very steep there where the body parts were found going down to the water. But that was also near Warnemont Park wasn't just by Lake Michigan, it was at Warnemont Park near Lake Michigan. The and second then, set, go ahead. I, the second set was found in a park just about 11 miles away. This was the playground park. And then two more are found really within, you know, a, a triangle, really an area where, uh, you know, two other parks. And these aren't huge parks. It's not like a state park. They're small neighborhood parks where things are found, and that's why they're found so quickly by people that are going to them. You mean parks as in jungle gym parks? Yes, exactly. And that, that was important to me, Alexis, because if you've got an open park, which is basically green space, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But a park where you've got a merry-go-round or swings or a jungle gym clearly meant for children as opposed to just green space where you can walk around, that's a whole nother animal right there. So three parks, three parks. This is meant for children to find. The first one by Lake Michigan at Warnemont Park. The second one, according to my notes anyway, April 5. The first is April 2. The second is April 5 near North 30th and Lisbon Street. The third one, as I recall, not too far away, a couple of blocks away at North 30th and Galena, West Galena Street. So all yes. three actually at playgrounds. Mm -hmm. all, all in little parks somewhere. And they're not, and they're in neighborhoods. These aren't you know, huge rural areas. It's in the middle of the city and the middle of neighborhoods, you know, small parks in, you know, between houses. Following the discovery of three sets of remains, a blanket is found. Listen. Sade Robinson's family joins the searches near the playground over the weekend. While police find unidentified human remains, Robinson's family discovers a blanket belonging to Sade. The distinct pink blanket pictures Sade with her beloved dog, Coco Chanel, who passed away. As more human remains are discovered, the family is losing hope Sade will be found alive. Alexis Therese Chuck, soon after that, a car is found burning and a blanket is found. I'm curious about the blanket. Let's talk about the blanket first. What is the blanket? The blanket has a young woman on it and with a dog, and it looks to be like um, a tribute to the dog that passed away. So we're saying rest in peace, and it's pink, and it has a picture of the dog. It looks like the dog was named Coco Chanel, or may, maybe the girl is named Coco Chanel, but this is what it looks like, like a tribute to someone's beloved pet that died. But they find this in the park. It's dirty. It, it's, it's in 
not good shape and, and it's in a park. Alexis, curious, is this blanket, uh, and, and we actually have one of these with our dog Fat Boy and our cat Cinnamon on it. The twins got it for Christmas. We have a pet tribute blanket and the twins fight over it. So was that blanket near one of the parks where the body parts were found? Yes, it was. And it's clearly a beloved pet. It's pink. It has a girl smiling on it. It's something that somebody really loved. Girl smiling on it. Mm -hmm. You know, curious right there. I, 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 I'm curious how you would approach this Bill Daly, formerly with the FBI. You find a discarded blanket, filthy, wet, with a pet on it. And let's see it again. Let me see that blanket because I can see the face of a woman on the top right near the body mm -hmm. parts where they were found. How do you go about tracing this blanket? And is it connected? Well, I mean, there's certainly, you know, several things you can do. Some will take longer than others. I mean, you can forensically start to treat that in the laboratory, you know, look for, you know, traces of, of hairs or other fibers or try to identify who that person, who the owner was. And you can also do things such as even using, uh, you know, facial recognition. You can scan the image of the face and compare it to known databases to see if one pops up. There's technology out there that allows law enforcement to search publicly available databases like driver's license uh, databases, et cetera. So, you know, some things you can start to do to try to find out uh, if they're interested in finding who the owner of the blanket is. And it certainly sounds like it'd be something you'd want to find out given some of the other suspicious circumstances that are occurring around the city. Almost immediately after the blanket is found, a mysterious, I don't know the timing, okay. Then to add to the mystery, a car set on fire. Listen. Three days after missing Shade Robinson's car is found burning in an alley near 30th and Lisbon Street, Milwaukee police find an unspecified human body part Friday evening at a playground just a block away. Over the weekend, authorities returned to the area to continue searching, focusing on the woods and train tracks behind the park. Unidentified remains are recovered both Saturday and Sunday. Welcome back. Uh, Alexis Terezchuk, a car on fire, and now we learn that that car belongs to who? Sade Robinson. She is 19 years old. She is still in high school, but she's taking classes at the local technical college. She's about to graduate. She has a full-time job. She is working at a pizza place right near her house, and the car belongs to her and it is found one block away from the park, one of the parks where the human remains were found. It is burned from the inside, something that the police have noticed. They said it wasn't, something outside didn't catch the car on fire, it burned from the inside, which led them to think that some, obviously something very bad had happened and somebody had set this fire inside the car and she is missing. To Matthew Mangino joining us, high-profile lawyer out of Lawrence County, Pennsylvania, and author of The Executioner's Toll, Matthew Mangino, tracking a car usually isn't an easy matter because there's a VIN, V-I-N number, that's etched, really, on a metal plate inside the car, and you can trace that VIN. It's like a fingerprint, and unless it's been tampered with, like the VIN's replaced, you can tell who bought it, and then the chain of custody has been sold and resold um, through insurance records and DMV records. So that's an easy matter, but this brings a whole nother level to it of arson. You know, I tried a lot of arson cases, and first, you have to prove there was a crime to start with and that it wasn't an accident, and that can be a Herculean task at times, very difficult. Then, once you prove it's a crime, you gotta prove who did it, but if these are connected, You've got a, a person who has, is responsible for three sets of body parts. Uh, you've got a missing high school girl. And you've got a car set on fire. I, right now, I think some of the best evidence is what we're going to find in that car. Well, yeah, I mean, certainly the, the police are going to scour that, that vehicle for any evidence that they can 
uh, find. Uh, you know, but when we start to put these pieces together, we, we have a missing person. We, we have her vehicle, which has been set afire. And then, you know, we know that through um, searching the area where these body parts were found, that a blanket, which can be identified as um, Chardet's, in this uh, park. So so now we're starting to, to, to get a, a bigger picture of what's going on here. Uh, you know, she's missing. Her family is worried about her. Her family is really in a position where they're, they're saying, you know, maybe the worst has happened here. The police have to match these body parts uh, with Chardet or whoever they might uh, be in order to, to bring, bring these together as well, homicide. I mean, you've got quite a bit of circumstantial evidence linking all of these facts. You've got a missing high school girl. You've got body parts, which, of course, according to Dr. Eric Eason, by now they can determine is a female. And you've got this blanket. You've got the car, body parts. We know it's a female, all in close proximity to Dr. John Delatore joining us, a renowned psychologist who specializes in forensic psychology, Dr. Delatore, uh, I was just mentioning that the, my children have one of those pet tribute blankets. And for that blanket to be found filthy, discarded, wet out in some playground, that would be highly unusual. And we've seen blankets, personal blankets attached to a lot of cases. Just for an example, um, Kelly Anthony was buried, or uh, not really buried, just thrown away like trash by her mother, top mom Casey Anthony, with her favorite blanket. And I could list many, many more cases where a personal blanket, a blanket, not something else, a blanket is with the dead body. And here we're finding her personal blanket with her face on it, for Pete's sake, near body parts. So in my mind, they absolutely are connected. Yeah, they could be. Here's what I would say is that the placement of the blanket will tell us a lot about why that blanket is there. So if it's laid out like that, where it's clear that you can see uh, her face on there, then I think the person that put it there is trying to tell us that these are who the body parts belong to. If the blanket was maybe crumpled up and maybe someone just kind of extended the blanket, I think that's probably trying to tell us that this person was discarded the same way that the blanket was discarded. So how the blanket was found tells us more about who put it there than I think uh, probably most people would consider. You know, another issue, Alexis Terezchuk, we were all, uh, on pins and needles trying to find Gabby Petito. And her family told us, Alexis, that they had received several unusual texts that didn't seem to be coming from her. For instance, one of them referred to her grandfather by his proper name. Who does that? Like, if I sent a text regarding my mom, I would say, hey, where's mother? I wouldn't say, where is Elizabeth Stokes Grace? I wouldn't say that. And in this case, uh, Shade's mother, uh, Sheena Scarborough, states that she got a very odd text from her daughter just before these remains were discovered asking her mom because she had $15. And she wouldn't do that. Like, my, my children wouldn't do that because they have a bank card connected to me and a credit card connected to me. They don't have to call me if they want to drive through McDonald's and get a quarter pounder. So the mom immediately knew, okay, that's weird. She knew something was wrong. Why do I care, Alexis? Because to me, that starts the timeline right there. And so at the same time, she had been reported missing, but not showing up for work. She always showed up for work. She was very reliable. She was a very responsible young woman balancing school, two schools really, and work. And so then her mom gets a text message saying, I need $15. And that's such a strange amount. I mean, $15, maybe the person 
you know, at work could give you $15 if you needed $15. So she was very suspicious about it. And that is around the same time that her coworkers are reporting that she did not show up for her shift, which was completely out of character for her. Bill Daly, I can't stress enough how important a timeline is because that could rule in or rule out potential suspects. For instance, uh, if I think I've got a suspect and I know what time that unusual text was, what if my suspect is out of town or at work, clocked in? Then that suspect is out. So, you know, there are a lot of ways to look at it, but here's an example, and timelines start in very unusual ways. For instance, here's a high-profile timeline start. Do you remember in the O.J. Simpson prosecution, neighbors heard, as they put it, a plaintive wail from the dog, Akita. They had never heard it before. It was like the dog was crying and screaming at the same time. They had never heard that. And I'm telling you, that marked the beginning of the timeline in that case. About right then, O.J. Simpson was running back to his Bronco to get, the, get away from the crime scene. And Simpson, if you disagree, come on and explain to me what really happened that night and subject yourself to my cross-examination. So what I'm saying is that text right there could mark the beginning of this timeline. Yeah, right, Nancy. It marks the beginning of a timeline of, of suspicious kind of you know, behavior, but we also need to look at the timeline much broad, broader than this. We need to look at seeing where that phone was. And by using analysis, and the FBI is great at this, and perhaps they're helping Milwaukee police on this with their cast team, they can start to look and see the location of that phone all the way along, including when that text message was sent, and then perhaps further on where that phone was until maybe the battery dies or where it's, where it's turned off. So there's a lot of things in here, but the timeline, as you said, is very important because it does start to suggest that perhaps there was someone else who was in control of that phone. Shade Robinson's family joins the searches near the playground over the weekend. While police find unidentified human remains, Robinson's family discovers a blanket belonging to Shade. The distinct pink blanket pictures Shade with her beloved dog, Coco Chanel, who passed away. As more human remains are discovered, the family is losing hope. Sade will be found alive. Facts lead police to an apartment complex, and they spend more than 24 hours searching a particular upper unit of the complex, a duplex, and they state that they discover blood in the stairwell and on a comforter. The homeowner is detained. Take a listen to this. Milwaukee sheriffs reveal Maxwell Anderson remains in custody as a person of interest connected to the remains found along Lake Michigan. Anderson has not yet been criminally charged, but does have a rap sheet. Anderson has several convictions, including disorderly conduct, domestic abuse, and DUI over the last 10 years. In two incidents, Anderson became violent with relatives and in a third beat a stranger who intervened in an argument between Anderson and a woman. Anderson is said to work as a bartender for several establishments in the Milwaukee area. Alexis Terezchuk, what, if anything, does this guy, this convict, have to do with a high school girl? That's what the police are keeping a little close to their chest, but what they have said is, cell phone records so a cell phone of his pinged near either where they found the car or where they found the uh the severed perhaps one of the the human remains but most likely the car a cell phone data put him in proximity to where they believe that Sade was missing or last seen so that is a big telltale sign that his phone to me bill daly it sounds like stranger on stranger um because we haven't found any link between this convict and a high school girl, but evidence is pouring in to make that charging decision. Uh, for instance, blood found in Anderson's home uh, matches the leg discovered at Warnemont Park. Blood evidence was discovered in Anderson's residence. And also, we're learning that Anderson, quote, was in contact with a missing person based on those cell phone records. Okay, what about it, Bill? Yeah, Nancy, in fact, uh, you know, in reading, reading through on this story, it was uh, uh, this person of, of interest 
uh, attorney uh, who came out and actually said that police had used some cell tower information and perhaps some, and it was kind of vague as far as the, you know, perhaps some some contact or some knowledge of, of a missing person. So uh, is a number of things tied together here, but as you rightly said, is that, you know, this is only enough uh, to, to perhaps attain the individual. It's nothing more to say that there's, there's a forensic evidence that, that ties this all together neatly. And that's what I think uh, police have been trying to do is trying to uh, work very, very quickly, uh, do DNA analysis, do cell phone analysis, do all the other forensic analysis they can in order to give that to prosecutors so they can move on this case if, in fact, this person of interest is involved. All I need is two DNA matches, and they don't have to be great. They can be mitochondrial matches. So to you, uh, medical examiner, Dr. Eason, I need a DNA match pronto between the blood in his apartment and the severed leg. Then I need to match the severed leg DNA to Sade. That's all I need. And I'm ready for a murder one charge. Agree, disagree? Yep. Agree. How hard is that? It shouldn't take very long. Technology is very and good And what days. about it? What about it, Matthew Mangino? You think I need more than that? I got a severed leg, a missing girl, and blood in his apartment. They all three match? Well, certainly that uh, would be adequate, but I would always want as much evidence as I can. Uh, you know, this is right. these incidents, the fire, the arson, uh, it's in a city. Uh, I'm sure there's video out there. I'd like to see some of that if it could be retrieved. I'd like to see hey. if we have any uh, hey. additional Mangino. video. Hey, Mangino, yes. Mangino, it ain't Christmas yet, man. I'm not going to tie it up with a bow and put it on the Christmas tree until we go to indictment. Right now, I want this guy behind bars. I don't want him to get out. We need a formal charge to hold him. Then you can work around the clock and build the case. We need him to stay behind bars until the case is built. We wait as justice unfolds. If you know or think you know anything about this case or about Sade, dial 414-935-7252. Repeat, 414-935-7252. We stop now and we remember American hero, police officer Paul Elmstrand, just 27, shot in the line of duty with officer Matthew Ruggi and paramedic Adam Finseth, they were responding to a domestic call. Officer Elmstrand survived by wife Cindy, two-year-old daughter Maria, and baby son Mateo. American hero, police officer Paul Elmstrand. Thanks to our guests, of course, but especially to you for being with us tonight and every night. I'll see you tomorrow night, 6 to 9 o'clock sharp Eastern, and until then, Good night, friend. Guys, thank you for watching Crime Online with Nancy Grace here on YouTube. To get the very latest, subscribe to Crime Online here.